First of all, I'd like to give my thanks to Denise and Annie for organizing this really awesome event uh, that I've already learned so much at and from you guys. And uh, I'm really glad it's happening. So I'm not actually really going to talk that much about the field. <laughs> uh, I'm going to talk about, I guess, if the field is the sort of world in which we create and make and share oral history, that will be, that will be my field. Um, I, I am the instigator, I am the creator of the Haiti Memory Project, which I, I think is actually a, an interesting counterpoint to what Stephen High presented us earlier today, which was this incredibly coordinated, well-funded, interesting, multi-actor multi oral history project. This is something I did with my summer. <laughs> Uh, without institutional support, or at least it began that way. I, in the wake of the 2010 earthquake, I was studying issues of memory and representation and so on and so forth in the context of Haitian history, and I saw the post-earthquake moment as a really interesting time to make an intervention into that conversation by going to Haiti and recording interviews with earthquake survivors. Uh, and that was, in the beginning, that was sort of the extent that which I was seeing this project unfold. Uh, and then I realized that if I was going to record them, I would like other people to listen to them. So I constructed this website. It looked different at the beginning, but I made a website and I used a, a program that no longer lets you use it for free called SoundCloud to stream the audio interviews that I did. Uh, I'll just show, sort of show you what this looked like. I ended up doing over a hundred. I thought I was going to be there for uh, six weeks and the experience ended up being so transformative that I called my advisor at NYU and I said, I'm dropping out of school and I'm moving to Haiti. And he said, don't, don't do that. Uh, we'll give you three independent studies, stay there for the next four months, uh, keep doing what you're doing, keep up the good work. Uh, and so I ended up living there for six months. And what happened with this website was that it really, I hadn't really known about DH or oral history communities online until I met, I created this website and then all of a sudden people were interested in it. And so I think, and one of, one of the really important developments in the history of this project is after I returned to the United States and started giving talks about the project, uh, a, a per, uh, the head of the Nunn Center for Oral History at the University of Kentucky, Dr. Douglas Boyd, uh, he and I met and within a very short amount of time we agreed to become collaborative partners and I ended up donating my whole archive, my whole archival collection to the Nunn Center. So as an individual sort of independent researcher, which I feel like maybe a lot of people in this room see themselves as, at least probably the younger junior scholars, uh, I think it's important, it was important for me to start, or whether or not it's important, it was definitive, that I started as just like me and my project and by creating an online presence and establishing this, I ended up acquiring institutional support. Uh, obviously the project was not funded by them, but the University of Kentucky now uh, has paid for the transcription and translation of about a dozen of my interviews, some of which I'm going to show to you shortly. The reason that this happened actually is because Douglas Boyd himself, I don't, uh, maybe you guys have met him or heard of him, he's a, a, a leading voice in the sort of DH oral history world. He runs this blog called Oral History in the Digital Age, uh, which is very informative. Um, and he's developing an interface to uh, present and interact with oral histories. He's, he's, he's addressing the same problem that I think a lot of people here have uh, addressed or are working through in their own way about how to keep the audio and the textual aspects of oral history in flux <coughs> instead of just relying entirely on one or why, usually instead of entire, relying entirely on text and then forgetting the audio. It's like how to keep the audio alive in that. And why he's interested in the oral history, in the Haiti Memory Project is because he's trying to develop a bilingual component to his interface. Uh, and unfortunately, he's, he's going to roll that out like next week, so I can't actually show you that. But I can show you his interface, which is called the Oral History Metadata Synthesizer, OMS for short. Uh, and it is, it, it's free. You can access it if you find that it would be useful for you. Um, so next I'm going to show you a little bit of that. 
And then I'm going to share with you guys a little bit how my thinking has evolved over the course of the past four years in doing this project and working with oral histories and the limitations I've found, constraints maybe, I found both in like the process, of like what, 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 what are my possibilities and like where am I being pushed by the technology and the, inf like the, the demands of the project and then also sort of oral history as a source in like my own, in my own uh, thinking as a, my own development as a scholar. Uh, so what do we have here? So, uh, so, so this is the Libby Center for Oral History. Um, so this is what, if you used ohms, what, is this even a good, this is uh, one of the ways that you could have your interviews be interacted with. Um, so instead, this is one of the ones that we do not have a transcript for. Uh, and so what I've gone through is I, I ta you, you, inter you interact with the interview by playing the transcript and then you can sort of go to a place where I've written a summary and then go to that spot. Uh, and you can sort of go through, and this is, this is, a, okay, but this is the user interface side of it. And another way, when you have the transcript, um, this is what it would look like. I think it's maybe a little, uh, little maybe a little clunkier than what I, what you were showing us earlier with, uh, what was the saving stories? Uh, stories matter. Stories matter, with that interface. Um, but it's attempting to address a similar problem. <laughs> so here's something where you have the whole transcript and you have the audio, uh, which I just Boss. muted, and then you can go through the transcript Boss. and uh, and click on a time, a time card, time mark in the, in the transcript and it'll bring you to that place in the audio. So you can try to always keep where you are with the sound factor uh, in, in coordination with where you are in the text. And so you, try to, you don't have to rely solely on the text. Um, and then if you were the person using this interface, this is what you would be dealing with. Let's see, did I lose that? I don't think I lost that. Do, 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 do. Um, let's go back. Uh, Okay, well, I think this is actually, so here's an interview that he put in, that Doug has put in here for me to play with. So here's an, oh wait, we have two interviews going on here. Oops. So here's an interview. And if we were, if you were working with this, um, and this is not, this is not um, transcription syncing, but you would be playing, you would get to a certain point in the audio and you could hit tag and then it inserts a timestamp and then you have all of this metadata that you can add into it. Uh, and so I actually kind of find, this is more what I've been doing with uh, ohms because without trans transcripts, I'll get to that in a second, can be very hard to acquire. Uh, but I, using this, I can go through, without actually having to transcribe the interview, I can write out like what this section of the interview is about. Like what are the themes we're talking about? What are sort of the key problems that we're addressing? And then obviously this is pretty customizable. You could do really whatever you wanted with it. Um, so all of that being said, in the interest of time, I won't, you guys are welcome to explore this site. I will highlight that, I guess I'm in Canada. There's a couple that are in French or that are primarily in French. Uh, a lot of them are in Creole, but if you speak, in, well, obviously uh, we speak English because if you can understand me, I have a few on the website that are in English uh, as the primary language. So if you wanted to, to learn more about my work, I invite you to, to check it out. And so now that I have talked about ohms, I'd like to talk to you guys about some of the, the things that I've confronted in my position as sort of, uh, as an individual researcher who's trying to do this kind of work without, institu without grants, without institutional support, um, it's hard, it's hard. Uh, primary, one of the things that I think makes the Haiti Memory Project interesting and one, definitely one of the unique challenges I'm dealing with is I'm working through multiple languages. Not all of them I speak as well as I speak English. Uh, I, for example, I can't do transcripts in Creole. I can't write it. I can, I can speak Creole. I've learned how to speak it, but I cannot actually listen to it and write down what is written. And so I, one of the things that the Nun Center and Doug and I have been working on is, is getting these professionally transcribed, but Haitian Creole is spoken probably by about 14 million people around the world, and the services that transcribe it are prohibitively expensive. 
Uh, and so it's actually it actually costs as much to transcribe one interview as it I I could I did six weeks in Haiti doing you know I did like you know as it to cost me to do 50 interviews living in Haiti and working uh, and so that's definitely one of the one of the limiting factors to the degree to which these interviews will be made available I should I should say often when I'm saying transcripts I'm also say, I'm, I mean in my head transcripts and translations like pairing those two together uh, and so what Doug, Doug is obviously working on the question of different languages from a more technical aspect, and I'm trying to deal with it from the, the I don't know, not the non-technical aspect, the, the more theoretical aspect. For example, one of the things I've realized, I began this project sort of probably as, as an impulse that I think a lot of people in this room probably share of like democratizing stories, the idea that like there are people whose stories could be made louder, could be made more available, and that that it was important and it should be done. But as uh, Stephen High mentioned this morning, and I think really, really provocatively and importantly, like who's listening? And we can have them and they can be there, but if they're not, if no one's listening or no one can listen, then you haven't actually completed the task that you set out to do. And I honestly, I'm, I don't know if I completed the task that I have set out to do. Uh, where's my mouse? My mouse is on this screen. Um, language, language barriers and working in multiple languages has really, like on the one hand, the fact that these interviews are in Creole is one of the reasons why they're so important to me, is because Creole, Creole speakers are people where, who cannot easily have their stories heard by others because of, of the power of language and the politics of language. But it also is true that having these interviews in Creole means that I can't, I, I can't break that barrier either, you know, or I haven't been able to yet. And not entirely, I have, of, of the interviews that are transcribed, we've transcribed all the ones in English, all the ones in French, and probably five or six of the ones in Creole. Uh, and, you know, I don't know how much more we'll be able to get done in the immediate future or the foreseeable future. Uh, the, other, the other limit that I'm working through right now with my experience with oral history is like, like I came to oral history because the, the source spaces that I saw available to me had limits. Like you, like if they, they were not representing ordinary Creole speakers, uh, for example. And, and the earthquake project in particular came out of the, the sense that in the post-earthquake moment and in the media storm that consumed everyone for a couple weeks, that all these ideas about what the earthquake meant were, were coalescing, it, what, what, what the earthquake meant to the world was coale were coalescing, but they weren't really including the perspectives of, of ordinary Herail speakers for whom the earthquake had completely transformed their lives in every way imaginable. Uh, and I wanted to, to insert that in there. But now that I have all these oral histories and I work with them, I, I recently published an article in the Oral History Review on spiritual interpretations of the earthquake and interpreting how evangelical Protestants and practitioners of voodoo see the, have, how, they, how they constructed their survival stories and how I saw, I proposed an interpretation of where these survival stories are embedded in sort of larger uh, religious conflicts in Haiti. Uh, that defines, it's not even just right now, it's been going on for a long time. But now that I, like, my question is like, can we use oral history to talk about something bigger than discourse, bigger than representation, bigger than memory? Are we, or, or is that the degree to which, is that as far as it lets us go? You know, and I guess that's one of the reasons, like, we want, people are attracted to oral history, including myself, like, because it brings the person back in. And because we see how historical experience is completely con uh, constituted by a person interacting with other people in the world. But on the other hand, like there's a lot of history and a lot of the perpetuation and reproduction of poverty and inequality that happens outside of the individual experience. And those are the questions that I'm increasingly attracted to. And I think like I have, I feel like an imperative to address. And I'm trying to figure out the ways in which oral history can speak to that or if oral history is, is, is like, can it, how far can it look beyond like the person or the interaction, like the interaction between the oral historian and the interviewee? Uh, 
And I'm sure there are ways, and I, I'm sure people in this room perhaps have, have, have attacked this problem, and I would love to learn from you, but right now I'm trying to work through that, and I'm trying, like, I don't want to just write about representation. Like, I don't think that's, I don't think that's going to do the work that I, I need, I want to see done, you know? But I also really think oral history, particularly in Haiti, is an important methodology because so, like, 52% of the population is illiterate, uh, and vastly, a vastly greater proportion of the population is completely excluded from, you know, various structures of power, uh, including historical production. Uh, and so I see oral history as a really interesting and important, potentially radical way of, of addressing that. You know, obviously I can't go back to the Haitian Revolution and <laughs> like, talk to people and be like, so what do you think you're doing right now? But, like, at least for, for the present moment, I could try to create an archive that for the future will be available. Um, but I don't, I, I don't know. There's so much that I want to do, and I see oral history as having so much potential, but I don't yet, my mind isn't yet flexible enough to put this source space in conversation with larger questions about uh, structural change or in the production and reproduction of poverty. Okay, thank you. group of four ladies from the Faculty of Education. Claire, can I get you to unplug over there? Perfect. Thank you. This goes to so each of you is going to present? We are. We're going to be... I'm going to introduce like them. I'm going to tell you who we are and where we come from. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to introduce the Sorry, sorry, sorry. Now we're waiting for we're waiting for our digital imagery. Do I have to talk into this thing? Okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to stand up because we can't put all four of us sitting together. So I will stand up and no, no, no. Just stay where you are. This is fine because we're going to be talking about imagery, about social media and whatever. You've got our topic: social media engages oral culture at Ugandan heritage sites. And I am Mary Lee Morby of York University. And I'm the research lead, I'm a faculty person here. And all these are my graduate students or former graduate students. So it's, we're a research team. And we, we have others that are joining us um, as we add Facebook to what we're doing. And so I lead our team and what we're looking into is Ugandan heritage sites and stories. Uh, it's a project a partnership project between the Uganda National Museum in Kampala and the York University Institute for Research on Learning Technologies that is now called Digital Learning, changed its name. And what we're doing really at the request of the Uganda Commission of Museums and Monuments and in conjunction with the Uganda National Museum and in conjunction with partner curators in that museum, we are researching, documenting, videoing, and photographing Ugandan heritage sites in a minute. Mary Pat's going to lead you through some of them. There are 100. We have done 10. And if I would ask any of you, do you know one Ugandan heritage site? I think you might be hard pressed. And this is true for people all over the world, and it's also true of Ugandans. So what we're doing is all this researching and video, videography and putting it into social media. And along with the actual sites, what we are capturing is the stories of people that have lived their lifetime, oral culture, oral history, their lifetime around individual sites. You're going to see some of those in a few minutes. And we're pressed to do this before they die and before this becomes what we call lost heritage. The work we're developing is going to be in a social media structure that is going to be loaded into the Uganda National Museum website. And this is going to be used to collect more stories from Ugandans all over the world, more imagery. We're going to keep collecting as we go. And it's also going to be to teach Ugandans about their heritage and to teach the rest of the world about this major heritage of the country of Uganda. 
Let me introduce my team, and then they're going to take over. Following me is going Maureen, is Maureen Sanoga. She is a PhD student here at York. Fin you'll be finished, she'll be finished in the next six months. We hope. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I already am calling her doctor and say you have to think in this way. She is also a senior lecturer in ceramics and art education at Shambogo. Did I do that right? Good. I'm getting better. Shambogo University in Kampala. And she's going to tell you very briefly the story of where this project came from. Our second presenter is going to be Michelle Seguera. She is also a PhD student at York University, and she is going to talk about um, the D or non-colonizing theories and methodologies that have guided our research for quite a while now. And then our third presenter is Mary Pat O'Meara. We're all M, 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 and we're getting another M, Morty, is going to join us in relation to Facebook. Mary Pat O'Meara is a 2013 master's graduate in the Faculty of Education here at York University. She is a gifted videographer and social media developer. We need, we need desperately our social media developer and gifted videographer. And she's going to show you, so um, we're going to have a demonstration of a YouTube trailer we have of the research that we've done. So, Maureen. Thank you. Um, I have a, a short story. It's long because this project started in 2006 and it's now eight years. Therefore, uh, putting this long story into four minutes is quite a challenge for me, but I'll try. Let me see what I can do. My story is about the birth and growth of this project that I initiated during a graduate course in the fall of 2006, where Professor Mobi was my course director. And in one of her papers that she gave us, uh, entitled Killing a Culture Softly, Corporate Partnership with a Russian museum, this is what she wrote, and I quote, thus far the study includes State Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, Russia, and the French Louvre Museum in Paris, with plans to add to the project a national museum located on the continent of Africa. So as soon as I read that, I raised my hand and said, we have a museum in Africa that doesn't have a website. So the project has evolved from a need to have a Uganda Museum website to showcase tangible artifacts to engaging social media in recording and sharing stories from Ugandan heritage sites. We have held a number of conversations and with stakeholders back home and we've had conference presentations as this one and contributed to publications as well. Now I give you a brief history of the Uganda Museum. The Uganda Museum was founded in 1908 and it is the first and oldest museum in East Africa. East Africa has Kenya, Uganda and Tanzania and now we have Rwanda and Burundi included in the East African community. The museum is the in the Department of uh, Antiquities and Museums, which falls under the Ministry of Tourism, Trade and Industry. And according to the National Culture Policy of 2006, this department has the following functions. One, to collect and showcase items of cultural interest. Two, to undertake research and documentation of cultural fields. Three, to identify, document, gazette, and present sites and monuments. Four, conserve and store cultural objects. And five, carry out educational outreach programs on cultural heritage to schools and communities. Uh, our project aims at fulfilling uh, the above functions. Now, outside the Uganda Museum, they are heritage sites of unique architectural structures that house artifacts of 
cultural significance and meaning. And these meanings are specific to certain ethnic groups. Uganda has over 50 ethnic groups and over 50 um, dialects. So we are rich in languages and uh, tribes. And all those have their own uh, cultural sites. Uh, these structures and objects have not been and cannot be inside the museum itself. And therefore, for a long time, there has not been any documentation of these sites. And this is what our project is trying to do. Given that our communication is rooted in oral tradition, and due to the fact that those with important information about these sites are dying, it's important that we capture this information before we lose it, just as Professor Mary Lee said. This project will enable us to build a researcher database as online resource for accessible primary data, more meaningful audience engagement, and better publication of findings. As a research team, we sat down in our discussions and identified challenges and possibilities for this project. And I'll just outline a, a few challenges and the possibilities. The challenges are establishing authenticity of information. And I think many people have talked about this before us. Two, sustainability of Web 2.0 presence could be affected by lack of computers and internet access. Three, there are limitations in the use of social media because people are not aware of the tools or they are not sensitized enough to, to, to use the tools. Four, there is unstable power supply, just as you had in Sierra Leone. This is an African problem and it still continues. And five, the immediacy in communication given the time difference because of the different time zones in the world. Uh, when it is winter here, Uganda is eight hours uh, ahead. And in summer, Uganda is seven hours ahead of Canada. So if you are to, to wait for information immediately, if you want an answer, it's quite difficult because of the time difference. The possibilities are, our people are very hospitable. You, you cannot go wrong with an African society. Whenever you go, you are welcome, and they will volunteer information, even if you haven't made a, a lot of effort to get it. Two, we have the cell phones available already. Although we don't have smartphones at that level as in the first world, but people know how to use the cell phones. And Facebook is very popular with our people. Therefore, we are going to, we are lucky that we have that in place already and we'll see how we are going to use it. Then we have the heritage sites are also accessible. Much as the infrastructure may not be so well developed in some areas, but you can easily get to the sites. English is our official language, therefore there is no problem in terms of translating from the local language to English because most people uh, use English in schools. Possible wider dissemination due to the over 50 dialects I've talked about. If we are to bring the community on board, we already have the languages in place and these people can communicate to us and then through translators we can get the information. This project is also has the potential to jumpstart research because as Professor said, we have 100 heritage sites, but there may be more which we are not aware of and therefore engaging the community will access more of these. And then if we are to use researchers, then that will enrich the kind of data and information that is not with us. And lastly, I think this social media is timely. And uh, it is important to note that the pr with this project, we are adding content that cannot be hosted in any other way. And therefore, the, uh, the museum website 
will become a communication platform among people and the site for learning from its users and the richness of shared data. That's the end of my story. Thank you. So I'm going to just highlight some of the things that Maureen has already talked about and then lead you into some of the things Mary Pat is going to show you based on mindful methodology. I think everyone in this room is familiar with uh, <laughs> everyone in this room is familiar with decolonizing research methodologies, indigenous research methodologies. We like to call it mindful methodologies because we don't like to label. It's the idea of working with people and respecting people. And these are a couple resources that we wanted to highlight. Linda Tulwai Smith's book is an interesting perspective uh, from the 90s looking at the indigenous community in New Zealand. There's also Margaret uh, Kovach has some wonderful stories working as an Aboriginal woman in Canada and struggling with her own identity amidst her research. And then Bagele Chilisa has uh, Baswanin from a colonized uh, country's perspective. Uh, some other really interesting um, practical things that you can do in your research, if this is something that we struggle with, as we all do. So some of the things that Maureen was talking about, we're really talking about frameworks. And when you're talking about mindful methodology, you're talking about what frames are already in place, what frames are you using, and then representations. Through those frames, what are you representing and how is it communicating a message? So the frames that Maureen touched on already are things like the origins of this project are audience-driven, user-driven, from the country, this is something that people have advocated for. It wasn't something that was imposed upon them. And we are you know, dealing with some of those, you know, those, store, those issues that you were facing about you, know, you need an audience. We really are trying to start with the audience first and what's available to them. Okay, well, we need people to listen to these things. So cell phones are what we're gonna use and Facebook is what's available. So not taking what we're used to having available and looking at what the audience and the users are actually going to be making use of. Voice and this idea of voice in frameworks is important as well. The partnerships that, that Mary Lee and Maureen uh, were able to set up really early on enabled the Uganda National Museum to have the largest voice, the, the heritage projects to be really the stars of the show. Um, as far as representations go, what Mary Pat's going to show you right now is really Something that, having been to Uganda and experienced the culture, as, limit, as limited as my experience of the culture is, really the level of music and color and passion that you see coming through in these stories that she's able to really work with in her, in her tech experience really is authentic cultural knowledge transmission in visual form. It is, it is culture off the page, out of the, uh, out of the tribe, as Maureen says, and onto social media for more to share. So creating authentic representations using the frameworks that Maureen already set up. And I'm not going to take any more time because I want you to see the beautiful pictures. <laughs> okay, what, what, how much time do we have left? Okay, we're just going to be super quick. So uh, um, it's, yeah, it's on YouTube. Our structure is basically going to be a content moderating system like WordPress, Facebook, Twitter. Yeah. Let's just, let's just get on with it. <laughs> so, 10 heritage sites, over 40 hours of video footage and interviews, thousands of photographs. Here is a tiny, tiny little taste. This is just the tip of it. Ngafa bali wana. Kwenye mili za nyumbu wa kabaka. 
Uh, she's wishing everybody to love also the nation. She's giving a message for everybody to love kingship, love the tradition. According herself, without king, we are also lost and we lose what we are in Uganda. Why do people come to this place? First of all, as I said, uh, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of Christianity. And the many people come here because of that. They believe that here we have the cradle of Christianity in Uganda. One hundred and thirty-nine girls were abducted by LRA forces on the 10th of October 1996. And then Sister Rakele, together with a teacher called Ochien bon John Bosco, followed the girls on bicycle riding, following them in the bush. And she arrived at around 11 a.m., around 40 kilometers from the school. She found the girls together with the LRA forces and she negotiated the release of the girls in captivity. So the area is uh, locally known as Amabere Gainamuyu and Amabere is uh, a local name, which is a local interpretation. Uh, so that name uh, refers to the live stalactites. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Good needs no introduction. Everybody probably remembers Annie from being the acting director last year and now the deputy director. And Annie is going to talk about her research. All set. Uh, so uh, the project that I'm going to talk about um, is funded by Social Science and Humanities Research Council, which as you know, SHRC is also funding uh, this Connections grant. It's a partnership development grant that is in its fourth year, but in fact the partners on the project have been working together for over a decade, in particular uh, f in Rwanda and activists in Canada. So I'm going to talk, uh, I want to segue by talking a little bit about Uganda, but um, only by way of connection um, with, our, with our, our previous presentation. So um, 
we are doing a project on women's experiences of abduction um, and sexual and other labor during war. So if we started our morning with Stephen High reminding us that the pitfalls of oral history and collaborative partnership are most starkly felt when working in a post-conflict situation, then we have indeed a situation where our, our project is potentially the most rife with problems. So um, we are a collaborative project working in five countries, actually in eight countries, um, in Sierra Leone, Liberia, DR Eastern Congo, Northern Uganda, and Rwanda, um, we, with university partners in Canada, the UK, and South Africa, eight countries. And this project, as I say, has been going on for a long time because many of the community-based partners in each of the five um, African countries have been, we've been working with them over a longer period of time on um, reparations, f legal reparations for harms experienced during genocide and mass atrocity. So the project started, in fact, as a monitoring of international justice mechanisms, grew from there as a docu to, into a documentation project, and, and then grew again when adding um, our, our historians of slavery collaborators and to where we are today. So I'm not going to talk about that, but it's really important um, for what I'm about to say that you kind of understand a little bit of that history of the, the partnership. Uh, I am trained in law. I have three degrees in law. I am a fake legal anthropologist. I am a, you know, I was hired in an interdisciplinary department with three degrees in a uh, discipline that thinks of itself really as not needing more than doctrinal analysis. So um, with all of that, that is my intellectual history. So I learn, um, as I am today, um, always really in, in partnership and, and as we're doing it. And in this, what I want to talk about is I want to take up the challenge of this uh, of this workshop and Stephen High's challenge of first thing this morning about how do we actually work in collaborative projects such as this on topics um, where sensationalism is a serious, I mean, perennial problem and where testimonials are circulating in a knowledge economy that not just is marked by inequalities in knowledge production, but marked also by sexism and racism and a commodification of women's bodies in a post-conflict situation. So, you know, all that is, is on the table. And I want to actually go, so this is our team. I just wanted you to see everybody who's not here with us in the room. Um, I want to tell a story actually first about going to the Rwandan genocide museum. I'm sorry, Sandra's not here. Um, okay. So, my, the partner with whom um, we've been working for over a decade in Rwanda is a woman by the name of Godiv Mukasarasi, who has a small NGO called Savota, and they have been working um, since the genocide with survivors of sexual violence and their children. Right now they're doing a lot of work actually um, because of course the children are now 20 and they're working, uh, they're ongoing issues of relationships between mothers and children, right? And um, so Godlieb and I um, last year went to the archive uh, and because we're working on the experiences of women who were abducted and referred to as wives in a variety of, of conflicts, the five countries that I mentioned. So we went to uh, the archive where they have been collecting oral testimonials. Well, I would call them, not, it's not, I would not call it oral history, I would call it interviews, and you're probably very well familiar with this. Um, they've been collecting interviews since 2003. And um, it just launched in 2010. So the, the actual, um, in the archive, the interview part was made public. And what was, what, so we went and we were asking about um, survivors of sexual violence and in particular survivors of forced marriage because Godlieb had been working with a group of women and a new and had documented already over a period of number of years cases of um, quote unquote forced marriage. And, I, and I'm not gonna get into all of the machinations there. And the head archivist told me, uh, well, that didn't happen. 
and we have no such interviews. I said, that's interesting, because Godlieb actually has some interviews. And Godlieb just kind of smiled. And, um, we, and, then I, and then he said, well, you know, you can talk to so-and-so who actually did some of the interviews. And so-and-so, another man, um, said, uh, mm, no, you know what, I do remember some things. And so what happened was everything was coded as rape. So because everything was coded as rape, you can't actually search the genocide archive in Rwanda for other, more, other forms of gender violence, socioeconomic gender violence, et cetera, et cetera. It's hard. It's not impossible. But the, the tapes were, and they also have, like you do, they, you, you listen. So at, you, you're, you listen and watch the interview for hours, and it is transcribed and translated. So you can see, you can do it that way the same as, as the, uh, I don't know what software they used, but so you can, you can use the, um, that in the, in the archive. But not only that, as you can tell by my sarcastic tone, um, no women were used to interview women. This is 2003. You know, talk about decolonizing and feminist methodologies that none of that was happening. And um, so, so indeed, when you watch some of these interviews, it's very painful to watch because it, it's a typical interview of only her face. And, and, and normally it's one person, but sometimes more than one person off camera asking the question. And the, the type of reciprocal, um, empathetic interviewing that you would expect to be taking place in that situation is not taking place at all. There is, it, there, it, is, it is marked by all the things that we're worried about and that we're talking about here. But anyway, they, they did, um, that is a really important thing. And, and our project, although, you know, very different. I was interested in, and Paul Lovejoy and I have talked about this, that there's so much material in gray literature and collected by NGOs. Again, um, back to the earlier point about what, you know, what is out there and who's sort of proprietary about it. Of course, non-governmental organizations in post-conflict situations often have lots of material where they have been interviewing uh, survivors of trauma in a post-conflict situation in order to document human rights violations. And I'm very much part of that economy, so I hold myself, uh, I try to hold myself accountable for this in reproducing some of these problems. But they, then you don't have access to that. So the community doesn't have access to that. Res other researchers don't have access to that. Grad students at the University of Makerere don't have access to that, et cetera, where War Child Canada is working in Gulu or um, Human Rights Watch is doing something on forced marriage in Eastern Congo, but no one has access to the interviews with the women who they worked with, right? So in our project, although f really far from perfect, I feel a little bit like the other pessimists on the panel, or uh, over the day, is we, and it takes a really long time, back to some of the other themes, we have been working with three researchers in each country, and again, the lead researcher in each country has been working on the project for a very long time. Uh, but uh, there are three researchers in each of the five countries who have done 50 interviews in two locations with um, a set template of questions. And so this was where uh, also the kind of hierarchies of uh, um, within research projects were really interesting because when we, d when we developed together the uh, interview template and the ethics and all the rest, all of a sudden, I found myself being really the social scientist at the table because my partners are like, oh, Annie, like, who cares whether we ask the same question? We live in oral traditions, you know, if we use this language or we use, and I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. You can ask just, you can ask all your questions once you're done the standard ones because how are we going to compare? And then all of a sudden, I'm like asserting, right, social science tip methods. But these moments, I actually wrote a short piece um, for Marcia Rue, who's here and works in health and disability rights, and um, called Participatory Action Research, What Participation, What Action? Because I actually, I think that we're still far from being able to really do this kind of collaborative project work in post-conflict situations for a whole host of reasons. And I totally agree. I think you said it's all, someone said it's utopian. Like, we're only working towards a Stephen maybe said that. Um, we're still working toward, and we, we really, that's all we can do at this point. And the successes that we have had, I think, is that, and, and I'll use Rwanda as an example, is that, and, and just that short vignette tells you this, where women with whom Godlieb and others have been working and have been, and, and actually they, she did produce for our conference in Sierra Leone in February of 2011, she did produce a video 
of um, the, of some of those interviews um, and edited t edited it together. But uh, they actually are documenting their their own history in their own language, a history that was denied. And if we can do a small imperfect, if we can make that small imperfect contribution then that's great. And it was very interesting because when I was in Kigali the last time, or the second last time, um, we screened that. Godlieb and I screened it for a number of the women who participated in the video and others who did not. And I was actually there to, to introduce the new project, but we really, we wanted, it, we wanted to talk about the video. And uh, they didn't care about the video going on YouTube, they didn't care. But when it came to an ethics discussion about the new interviews, they said, but Annie, will my neighbors know? I said, you just said that it's a-okay to put that video on YouTube, but you're worried about, and then other women would say, everybody knows what happened to you anyway. Like, what are you so worried about? And they got into this huge discussion. And so it, one has to be very careful about that process, about what I, and it is, I totally agree, it's a reciprocal relationship, an exchange of confidentiality, and how I treat their stories. And, and they, you know, they have to know I'm not the Canadian government. They think, oh, she looks a bit like a bureaucrat, right? <laughs> <laughs> looks like a development worker from Canada, you know, yet another one. And so one has to be very careful that they also know what I'm under undertaking to do and how we are coming back. So all the teams then go back, they will be going, we're just in the process of taking the interview material back. Um, it is transcribed, all, n not all of the interviews are transcribed and on the digital archive but not publicly available because we haven't finished redacting them. And so eventually we are committed to making that material publicly available, which is almost unheard of in this area. It's almost unheard of. Um, and again, I tip my hat to my colleagues at Tubman because it's, a, it's an environment in which we believe that there has to be meaningful accessibility um, to what we're doing. Um, and, you know, that. But the, the, what I want to, what I want to close on, I think if I'm nowhere close to my notes, so I'll just, I'm sure I'm about, I should close, right? No, actually, you eight or nine. Oh, okay, okay. I always think I talk too much. Um, the, but the, the challenge that I also want to put to you is, um, is coming back to the point about doing work in post-conflict situations on part with partners who are, our partners are mostly frontline service providers and then the, the, the university-based researchers are some Macquarie University of Sierra Leone, but also, as I said, South Africa, England, and Canada. And, you know, even doing SHRC grants reminds you about issues of the, the speed, as you were saying, right? The speed on connectivity, even access to electricity, like all of these things. And our whole funding structure is set up in that way. And it's, it is, you know, it just makes you pull your hair out to say nothing of trying to transfer money um, to our partners um, who are doing the work. It's, it's ridiculous. Um, so there are those sort of administrative things. But also, I've worked um, since the late, since the mid 1990s, on the topic of of marriage and consent and and violence, and uh, in particular on early age at marriage and that and early age at marriage and, and forced marriage. And of course, my topic all of a sudden has become hot with the Canadian government. So the whole girl bride um, initiatives and girls not brides and too young to wed and photo exhibits and all the rest. So I so then the our own project becomes part of this larger environment where there are a lot of images of in post -con of post conflict situations of girl brides and so on and so one has to be even more vigilant about the contextualizing and about the ethics and the politics of that um, production and dissemination and circulation because indeed um, I wouldn't you know here's a situation where we're in particular working against um, you know the central problem in early enforced marriage is that girls and young women are commodified. The central challenge in doing oral histories in post-conflict situations with girls, young women, and young men is that their stories can be commodified 
circulate it, put into an economy of knowledge where they become worthwhile in certain ways. They come chopped up. It's not just the juicy quote. It's the, you know, the modern slavery narrative that's reduced to a couple of thousand words and used to for fundraising for non-governmental organizations, for people to get tenure like me, and for, you know, really, I sit in a totally secure situation. Our partners are all non-salaried, doing work as volunteers, living in very, you know, two of our partners in Eastern Congo cannot be living any longer in Eastern Congo because of the work they're doing on sexual violence. That's the context they're working in. You know, right now our other partners in Sierra Leone and Liberia, you know, they can't work for three days because they're under quarantine. Our Medica Mondial colleagues, two people died, not our team, but our partner's team. I mean, this is the context that they're working in. And someone's arguing with me about a password at Shirk, like I just can't, like whatever. But, <laughs> yeah. But the point, my point is a serious one though. My point is a serious one where, you know, these issues about consent and agency and evolving personhood are at the very core of the theoretical problem that we're, and, the, and the, pr the, the social practices that we're looking at, both in times of relative peace, peace in historical and contemporary context, and, and yet, and so we have to make sure that we bring those back to our own project. And indeed, the, this, the, the issues of consent that I mentioned before are very, very complicated because you have to, under, like, people have to understand, like, what it means to consent to participate in this way. And so I think that sort of in this world of humanitarianism and international law and non-governmental organizations, uh, it's, it's easy um, to see how we can fall into those pitfalls, uh, the very pitfalls that we criticize others for doing. And, and I, as I say, I mean, I, I had to make sure that I wasn't using the juicy quotes uh, because uh, we also are trying to communicate the urgency and the authenticity in the in in Michelle, in no not the other Michelle, uh, you know authenticity to some extent. Well, I usually would start. People make fun of me, but I do I do usually start with a story um, in most of my presentations. Uh, I would normally have started uh, in that, and uh, you know I I, I I chose not to in this environment. Um, but there must be other ways of narrating violence without reproducing um, knowledge inequality and that's less prone um, to the ways in which we in law tend to circumscribe the story. So in law we actually try to get it down to the, the version of the story that's going to find the commander responsible for the crime against humanity, right? So a lot of the material that's being produced right now, Rwanda, Sierra Leone and elsewhere are witness statements given to various courts. And those are, for, they're, they're being interviewed for particular purposes, but that is actually generating a lot of data that I hope will, it's not yet publicly available, but it's coming available. So how do we actually try and produce narratives, stories, oral histories that are not going to fall into that trap of circumscribing at the same time that doesn't fall into the trap of voyeurism and sensationalism of popular culture or the racism of the colonial gaze? And how do, we, how do we, at the same time, take up that challenge? Because I'm, I'm not one that says we shouldn't do it. Because I actually think if you leave, if you leave it unattended, then we actually, um, and, and actually, it's, it, I don't actually think that you have that choice. Not when partners say, no, this is actually an important part of missing story of this. This is a missing part of history, and we want to participate in filling that gap. So how do we do that? How do we know and come to know things about the ways in which what's happening today in contemporary conflicts is linked to previous experiences of enslavement um, in other era. And how do, we, how do we listen in a way that's attentive to the ways in which the story is told, the structure of the way in which the story is told? Because I think it tells us as much about us as audience as it does as about the storyteller. And this, of course, we get from Natalie Zeman Davis's work on fiction in the archive. So I think there's much frailty to the archive physical, you know, uh, not just physical, but um, in other ways too, and there are lots of ways in which scripting the story is problematic. But I nonetheless think that there's transformative power in the narrative and narrative advo advocacy. Thank you. Well, thank you to all our speakers, and I think we'll just go right to questions since we're making up some time here. But these are fantastic examples of different kinds of projects, and I think we can all uh, think of questions that we have 
Claire, very noble to develop this from the ground up. And I can imagine this rogue website starting to pop up yeah. in your university. Good for you. And it's great to see that you got the institutional support, even from another institution. And to the ladies working on the Uganda project, as the distinguished professor, Paul Lovejoy, went over, leaned over and said, wow, I just found somebody working on Uganda in this university. So <laughs> you taught Actually, Paul. Actually, Denise found someone. <laughs> yeah, you found, you, you taught Paul something. Denise found. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And well, you found out about, and thank you to Annie for bringing some real life uh, problems into the narrative. So, questions? Um, I have a question for Claire. Uh, your interesting and very important project. Um, in various ways, you subtly and not so subtly referred to the fact that there's a funding problem. And I don't. I would like, I, I, I would actually like to know more. I, I'm, I'm assuming, I may be wrong, I'm assuming that you're not a Canadian, that you're an American. Because I don't, I think one of the patrons of the Tubman Institute is Macau Jean. And I, I'm not, I, I would suggest that, <clears throat> that you contact her foundation in Ottawa. Um, because I find it <clears throat> astonishing that you can't get the funds to do the translation from Creole into French and English when there is there. We've had a number of projects with with Haiti, both before and after the earthquake, um, and of course her interest is enormous, and her influence is even more enormous. And. Um. <clears throat> How do you spell her first name? <clears throat> hmm? <laughs> okay, yeah, <laughs> excellent. Mikhail Jean? Uh, Mikhail, okay, Mi hey, Mikhail, excellent. Um, yeah, it's it's possible that it's also a lack of energy and creativity on my part to find funders. Because I associated with an institution, like that institution has also taken over the not yeah i would say taken over that element of it as well like the fun and then they work through their own channels and they have their own possibilities and limitations um and for better or for worse you know uh and it's definitely allowed my my by by connecting with an institution and finding a home for my project i've definitely things have become possible that were not possible before for example getting anything translated and transcribed professionally uh but i um I would love to come back from this conference with ideas about how to push that farther. So thank you. I need to be recorded. Is that loud enough? <laughs> a comment and, and then a question, because I'm concerned also with many of the things you're concerned with. In our work, we. Um, work with the St. Mary's Women's School yep. near Lira in northern Uganda. Yep. And perhaps you have contacts um, with those group of women that were um, taken off and became wives, forced wives. And then many of them have returned, and some of them haven't. So we have a contact. We heard some of those stories yep. in relation to um, the violent heritage reason heritage in northern Uganda. So we could give you a contact. Beyond that, um, or other than that, because that's a very important thing, the question that I think you started out with, how do we truly work? I'm going to rephrase you. How do we truly work in collaboration, in partnership collaboration transnationally? Mm -hmm. One country to one, or one country to two, or however. Um, it's a very important and difficult question. We've spent years. <laughs> now we're partners. And we learned that just in a happenstance way when we were in Kampala. Um, th that's a very difficult area. And to keep working out the details, who does what and what relates to work, what and our research we give to the Uganda National Museum, so it's not an ownership thing. Um, now, there's one other part. Has it skipped my mind? No, it hasn't. Um, 
Right now, I'm writing a large team shirt grant. We, um, Claudia, we have Claire. Sorry, we have we have a fund, funding agencies in Canada. They're very difficult to get. They're very competitive, but they're good grant. They're very good grants. They're well funded, and then you do whatever. Um, the problem I find, and perhaps you can address this, is. Um, I'm writing one now between Canada and Uganda. It is not a partnership grant. And after this meeting, Maureen and I are going to fill out her Shirk Web CV, that beautiful Canadian template, which is hor horrific. So a Ugandan's going to fill, fill that out. Um, the problem I find with those grants, the monies, you can go all over the world. But the monies generally have to be paid to Canadians. You can do all kinds of other things. So how do you work that further? We figured out ways to expand the money, food and digital technologies that we, we, we can do it in all kinds of ways. We can't pay the Ugandans. It sounds as though you can give funds. Yep. Now, is that with the partnership grant that you can give funds? I'll answer the second one um, first because it's, well, they're both um, really points of information. So, uh, yeah, we, we coupled a partnership development grant from SHRC with an IDRC, International Development Research Council grant um, that also supplemented the costs of the field research. We pay, you know, we send $10,000 directly to Monrovia. We send $10,000. Um, to our head of research in Uganda, Teddy Atim. Um, and uh, we have found that, I mean, it's better um, if, you're, you, if it is an institutional partnership because then you send the money directly to the institution and Shirk likes that a lot better. Um, but we haven't actually found, when I um, held a, a full team meeting in Nairobi a couple of years ago, I had a partner who was at the Open Society in Nairobi. I sent the full cost of the meeting, $50,000, from York to Nairobi, and then we just dealt with it on the ground. We paid everybody and hired local staff and did all this sort of stuff. It's not easy and it takes some time and so on, but that part we've actually sorted out. But it may be the structure of institutional grants where I'm sending money from York to my institutional partner. If it's an individual, she tends to have to invoice me and that's a problem because people don't ha they can't just pay for their, their, their fuel to get to wherever they're going to do the work and then invoice me after. It doesn't work like that. People don't have that money. So then you yell and scream and you know, do all that. Okay. Um, our partners in Uganda do, our head of team is Teddy Atim, um, who has worked for a long time with Tufts University. Uh, she herself is doing her doctoral work in Europe right now. She's um, based in Kampala, but um, knows the three regions where we're doing interviews very, very well. Another of our partners is a woman who I can name and, and discuss her experience because she's been public about it. Her name is Grace Aka who was one of the Aboki girls who was taken um, from that school, very similar. Um, and so she's one of the Aboki girls. She was then, she was held for a very, very long period of time. She lost a child during the conflict to overhead government bombing, and she's just finished her um, biography, so she, she's going, she's publishing her own story, not based on an interview, but what's inter, like it didn't start as something and then she had to get permission from the British Library. What, what's interesting though is that her, her work did start at, in a storytelling um, project that was partly funded by Canadians again, and the and Swedish, I think, um, Aaron Baines from the University of British Columbia, who's a new partner on this new grant, uh, ha it works out of JRP in Gulu, and they did a storytelling project with, um, with women who uh, were had been held for long periods of time and there it was never meant to be public it was always meant to be it was meant to be totally private as a way it was a it was support for each other and some and grace has gone on to be a real leader and when i was with her in gulu i mean it's clear that she plays a real leadership role now and she's she's doing the she does the interviews so um again this all takes time it, these relationships have to grow over time you have to be very attentive to the things but yeah so um and the other the other is uh, the refugee law project and chris dolan because we're now expanding because part of what we learned um is and what we're interested in is no one's done any interviews on masculinities male violence experiences both of men being violated but also being ordered whether men experience it as sexual violence to be ordered to be sexually violent the question's never been asked 
Uh, and so that's part of the next project is working with men. Um, so we'll see. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question maybe for both Annie or Claire, or both of you can answer it. It's really um, to follow up on this worry about um, the commodification of stories so that the larger question is wh who are these stories for and you know what what is the function um, so in your project it, how do the Haitians um, the narrators or Haitian communities um, do you do you think about that as a part of your project or as part of your project just you know it's not just because it's a huge part of it the collection and for Annie um, you emphasize the importance of um, local um, partners and who really want these stories to be told. Um, what f what format is is this material being kind of disseminated or shared? And how how do you in what ways have you thought about how these stories are then circulated in the local context? Um. So it's funny because I always think I'm going to suddenly sound louder, and I don't. <laughs> uh, that's actually been one of the things that I've spent a lot of time thinking about and wondering about and pushing towards and against. Because I, uh, the, both the limitations of my project and the constraints upon the people that I interviewed have made it such that there's not a con continued long-term collaboration. Uh, one time I, I tried to bring some CDs of interviews down because uh, bringing, bringing a digital copy or like a, I don't know, like a thumb drive is completely useless. But even a CD is like a CD player, something that someone has. Is that accessible? Is it something that they want? One of the things that I spent a lot of time pulling my hair out over uh, was the idea that once I secured these transcripts, the best practices is to then return the transcript to the person and have them review it. Transcripts are written documents. They require reading. When I am interviewing someone for who can't read, what do what's that relationship like? Uh, and then well, there's a woman named Beverly Bell who does some really, really, really impressive uh, community activism work in Haiti, and she does oral histories and stuff. But she describes in her, in her uh, introduction, she describes years of going back and forth with the actual audio file and then listening to the audio file with the person that the interview is with and, and discussing it with them and using using the oral, the audio file as the transcript and then going back and editing that. And I, I haven't had that, poss I don't have that back and forth. Uh, I can't travel to Haiti that often. Uh, I don't email with these people. Um, uh, there was something else I was gonna add to that. And so that's been, that's been one of these things where I, I see what the platonic perfect oral history project is supposed to be, and I see what I've done, and there's a difference. Um, oh, the other thing I wanted to add was that the, the live, because, well, first of all, because life, both because of the constraints and the, the life, the nature of life in Port-au-Prince, but then also the life in the post-earthquake moment, I don't even know if I, can, like the phone numbers I have for people don't work anymore for a lot of them. Like every time I go back, I have, I bring my lists of all, everyone I interviewed and I start calling, you know, and I try to set up follow-up appointments either to let them know about the, where my project is and how, how their, their interviews are being used or to do follow-up interviews and more like these numbers are no, are no longer their phone numbers and these people don't have, a lot of them were in displacement camps when I interviewed them and so then trying to relocate them again, uh, has been in incredibly challenging. Uh, and so that's definitely one of the ways in which I wish my project uh, was more platonic, platonically perfect. Uh, great question, thank you for that. Uh, the, the project actually has a number of um, different dimensions or a number of different objectives when it comes to you know, how the material will be used by partners. Um, and so obviously we started um, as a legal monitoring project in the in the early 2000s, so th there remains a legal dimension to this where um, we are not 
we are not, our, our partners may choose to use it for advocacy purposes in claims for reparations and so on. So in Sierra Leone, the reparations process is closed, but there were a number of women um, who gave, who worked with us and, and gave Rosalind McCarthy, our partner there, um, in, you know, who worked on the interviews and gave them information about the ways in which there is still an impact on their lives, their children's lives, education, and so on. So they are then using those stories to try and, as a, as a women's group, to try and advocate for better reparations for women who are left out of the, the national official reparations project. In Uganda, that process is just ongoing, and so again, um, organizations can, the groups on the ground can use that, those stories in the reparations claiming. The other, of course, is a public history um, goal and objective, um, which is more kind of amorphous, and we haven't yet figured it out because we wrote into the partnership development grant the final year where um, people, you know, the, our partners can decide along with communities in which they were working how they want to represent those stories. And we're just at that point now, so I'll be able to better answer your question a year from now. But we did originally partner with the Liverpool Slavery Museum, who had agreed to do any kind of exhibit that we wanted um, coming out of this project. We may still do that, we may not do that. They may decide to, uh, Grace and her group may decide to use the money in order to set up a website for their now new um, Women's Initiative Network win, you know, in glue. So they're going to decide whether they want to do it on, you know, website. Do, do they want to do a poetry thing? What are they? Whatever. Do they want to do, you know, some sort of um, popular theater? So that hasn't yet been decided. But I'm going to shamelessly uh, probably, you know, use some of Concordia's ideas because those I think will work, would work really well in our project, and we're just not there yet. But it was two hundred two hundred and two thousand dollars. So there's only so much you can do. Thank you. Great question. Can you, can you pass down the Hi. Um. Thanks. I there was a lot. Um. I might check back in with some folks around resources that they mentioned to get spellings, etc. Um. My question was around. I've heard a lot of um, conversations around. Uh, social location and positionality and um, of, of people conducting the research um, and it's a question and a comment because I don't know if folks will have responses to it but I'm curious about the ethical considerations for a person who would be doing research that's from that particular community um, particularly in the context of um, post or current conflict situations um, and I bring it up because there's a real gap and there are lots of reasons systemically why that gap is present, but I'm also curious as a person who ha has intention to do work in the Somali community, which is post-current transitionary conflict, um, what some ethical considerations around that research might be. I feel like you gestured to that when you talked about how people... Do you want to talk first about Uganda? Do you want to... And then a, I just feel like I'm dominated. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too chatty. I didn't realize that she had already. Oh, right. I have to get recorded. <laughs> um, what is your location? Where are you located? What is your, at York? Okay. So you're in a Canadian context. You're in a York context. The research, you're, um, you're a York researcher doing, are you a professor, graduate student? You, okay. So you're going to do our, as a graduate student, our ethical review forms. Okay. Now, in Uganda, every person with whom we work fills in one of these forms. And if they speak Luganda and not English, then, then we have someone explain to them in Luganda what the form is. The people working in the museum work with our forms. And they're, we're all in agreement with this. The Ugandans feel very protected, and we've been told we're going to places they won't, they won't talk to you, they won't fill out the forms. And once we explain to them that they're protected and how they're protected and what we're doing, we've not had one issue. Um, now, I don't know if this is getting at the kind of question that you're asking. All our part, we use um, an ethical form that all partners use in their similar forms, and anybody we work with. Um, in Uganda, signs these forms. Certainly. You have to be recorded. 
Yeah, there is just, there's somewhere where ethics hasn't really caught up yet, and that's the digital space. So there are definitely some things that, I mean, I think you asked a lot of really important questions, Claire, at the end of, of your presentation. Some very daunting uh, questions about the commodification, which was mentioned already, but also um, there are issues of security around how these things are being used. And I mean, I could go on to, on to her website and I could download the audio file and I could remix it if I wanted to. I could, I could mess with the audio, I could switch even what someone has said, right? So the sanctity of story. So these forms that we're talking about are of course archaic, which I think we can all agree on, but they're what we have to work with, right? And what I think if you want to consider a digital space, the use of stories and the sanctity of story in digital spaces, you're going to be looking at some ethical issues that aren't yet addressed. And so that's what some of these conferences and workshops are, are about addressing. Uh, yeah. But I actually, yeah. No, I, know, I mean, you're talking about trauma. Yeah. Because so whenever our team gets together, we talk about trauma. Because amongst our partners, we have, um, you know, people who, um, unfortunately, you know, I would say probably get sick more often than the average person, um, need to take a stress break more frequently than the average person. They are listening to testimonials uh, of war, regardless of whether it was 20 years ago or, you know, 10 months ago. Uh, this takes a huge emotional toll. Um, Godliev um, herself does some of that counseling, so she will tend to lead, like we in, in two years ago in November in Nairobi, she led um, and she called it post-traumatic stress um, discussion. Um, I know there's a critique that this is all produced uh, uh, in the West, but in fact it was a Kenyan and a Rwandan who wanted to talk about um, post-traumatic stress. So they talk about, so we talk about it both for identifying, and, and you touched on it this morning too, identifying in the context of the interview when you need to stop. Like when, you know, the sort of, you know, that, and because again, the three people doing the interviews in each of our countries, they weren't, they're not trained in this area. So there always has to be the referral all set up, ready to go, you have to make sure everybody understands that, but also their own health. We talk a lot about their own health and their own security because um, you're absolutely right, it's not on any ethics form. Um, the, and in fact, we answer, you often answer that question that has to do with security in terms of security of the information, and we, we want to answer it in terms of security of the interviewer. Um, so there's that. And the, and the last thing that I would say is that um, it's one of the, t I find it a real challenge because I don't actually have enough time. I must, uh, it's totally my, I take th this uh, very seriously, but I've, I've failed at this, I would say, in, in our project. I don't actually have enough time in, in my week to do the kind of Skype check-in and uh, emails and I get behind on communication and I think it to, to support the research teams you need really a lot of you need more time just to check in with people and we have someone on our team who, who does that but you know we're a bilingual multi um, time zone team with a variety of disciplinary backgrounds and but it's it's really you know it's really a very s serious gap that we often don't talk about um, in terms of the the impact on the researchers who are doing the interviews um, day in day out who themselves may be survivors because in each like in each of those in each of our countries many of the people doing the interviews are themselves survivors so and I, I, I think what I'm also speaking to is the particular the um, the separation in academics from the people involved in the research as often having the lived experiences that they're not, they might not share or disclose as part of the research they're doing. Um, so there is, does that make sense? So there's a significant gap between, between those two pieces. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And that people are transnational. Right. And mobile and also engaged in. Right in diasporic conversations because those are folks of their community. Precisely. And so the, yeah, so we, so when I hear the question around who does this narrative construction impact or who's it for, I also think about who do we ignore um, as part of that conversation who's already in the space or in the room or present just by virtue. Precisely. Yeah. Precisely. Yeah.